Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 779 for August 4th, 2019. Coming up in a few minutes. I think it's it's really unfortunate that the reason why the story of New Year's Green and Jack Daniel, the reason why it's resonating with people so much is because it's a story of hope for our current time. If you've been following the headlines in the U.S., you can't help but see that the issue of racism is back on the front pages. And to be fair, it's really never been far from the front pages for very long. Next month, the first phase of the Uncle Nearest Distillery will open in Lynchburg, Tennessee. And the latest edition of Uncle Nearest Tennessee Whiskey has just been released. Uncle Nearest 1884 gets its name from the year when Nathan Nearest Green is believed to have filled his final barrel of whiskey before retiring. I'll talk with Uncle Nearest founder Fawn Weaver on Whiskey Cast in depth. That's just ahead, along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice behind the label, and much more. All on this edition of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know know Redbreast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. We'll start off with Brexit, where new British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's insistence on exiting the European Union October 31st, whether there's a deal in place or not, has Ireland's whiskey industry even more nervous than before. Johnson insists on scrapping the so-called backstop designed to prevent a hard border between Ireland and Northern Ireland as part of any new negotiations with the European Union. That would likely mean the reimposition of border checks, with not just an impact on cargo shipments, but also delays for tourists crossing the border. Since the UK is Ireland's largest source of visitors, that could mean cuts in tourism. Rosemary Garth of Irish Distillers is the chair of the Drinks Industry Group of Ireland and told reporters that a large-scale reduction in visitor numbers from the UK would have a recession-type impact on Ireland's drinks and hospitality business. The group is calling on Ireland's government to lower excise taxes on alcohol in the 2020 budget to help businesses cope with the impact of a no-deal Brexit. On the business side, it's too early to say whether this is just a one-off occurrence or the proverbial canary in the coal mine when it comes to a potential bubble in the whiskey business. Shares of MGP Ingredients took a sharp tumble this week after the Kansas-based company reported a sharp drop in sales of aged whiskey during the past quarter. It's the largest supplier of bulk whiskey in the U.S., and CEO Gus Griffin acknowledged that MGP might have problems making its projections for sales of aged whiskey through the end of the year. Griffin told analysts that the company has been holding the line on prices, But sales volumes are down because some customers have been having problems putting together enough capital to make larger purchases. MGP's sales of new make spirit showed slight gains during the quarter, but the concerns still sent MGP shares down by 26% Wednesday after the announcement. They made up some of those losses by the end of the week, but still ended the week down 12.5%. In other news, we reported last week on Beam Suntory's plans to build a new craft distillery at its James B. Beam Distilling Company complex in Claremont, Kentucky. While it'll be named for master distiller Fred No, his son Freddie will be using the distillery 
as a place to work on his Little Book whiskies, along with distilling future releases of Booker's and Baker's bourbons. The third edition of Little Book received its annual exclusive preview in Esquire magazine this week, and even Fred No was not allowed to find out what Freddie came up with this year ahead of time. He hadn't shared with me what's in it. I did hear him say in one event that it was all bourbons in it. But that was as far as he went. He looked at me when he said that. Because he knows if he tells me, I will let the cat out of the bag if I'm talking to somebody like you. I got in trouble before, so you know, my track record is not good at keeping the secrets on a little book. So <laughs> He likes it for it to be a secret. And so he's, I'm not going to tell you. Said, That's fine. Don't tell me anything, Freddie. I'll wait till everybody else finds out. Now, I have tasted the liquid. It is very good. He does let me taste, but he doesn't tell me what it is or what he's using. He's asked my opinion. Like I told him, it doesn't really matter what my opinion is. It's got your name on it. It's your product. Well, I want to know what you think, Dad. I said, okay, well, thanks. And he lets his wife taste. He like, lets my, my wife taste. His mom, his wife, and me are his sounding board, but I know he's like his grandfather. It don't really matter what we say. He's already made up his mind. He knows what he likes. So far, we've we've matched his what he likes so far, so we'll see. This year's version is nicknamed The Road Home. It's a blend of all four small-batch collection bourbons, Knob Creek, Booker's, Baker's, and Basil Hayden's. But they were all blended at barrel proof instead of the lower-strength bottled versions. And, of course, Booker's was already at barrel proof. All four were created originally by Fred's father and Freddie's grandfather, the legendary Booker No. No word yet officially from Beam on availability. It's expected to sell for around $125 a bottle. Gordon and McPhail has unveiled its latest private collection releases. There's a 53-year-old Longmorn single cask that was filled back in 1966, along with two whiskeys from Long Closed Distilleries, a 1982 St. Magdalene and a 1969 Dallas Dew. The Longmorn and Dallas Dew whiskeys have a UK recommended retail price of 6950 pounds each. That's around $8450 at current exchange rates. While the St. Magdalene will sell for 1000 pounds, that's about $1215. Diageo is releasing a special Oban limited edition that will only be available at the distillery. Old Teddy honors the three generations of the McLean family that have been working at the distillery since 1953. Old Teddy McLean was a first-generation master distiller. His son, Young Teddy, came on board in 1985, and Derek McLean joined the team two years ago. It's priced at 150 pounds a bottle at the Open Gift Shop. Ireland's Clonakilty Distillery has given its flagship single batch whiskey a new name. It's now being referred to as Clonakilty Single Batch Double Oak Finish. No change in the whiskey, which starts out in ex bourbon casks. It's then finished in a combination of virgin American oak and specially shaved, toasted, and recharred European oak red wine casks. It's on sale in Ireland, Europe, and the U.S. Meanwhile, Teeling Whiskey Company in Dublin is out with a new distillery-exclusive Irish whiskey that's finished in Chinkapin Virgin White Oak Casks. It's on sale at the Teeling Gift Shop for 60 euros. That's around 67 U.S. dollars at current exchange rates. Washington, D.C.'s Joseph A. Magnuson Company has released its latest batch of cigar blend bourbon. As with the previous batches, Batch number 14 is finished in Armagnac casks under the supervision of master blender Nancy Fraley. And finally, last month we reported on what has become known as the Missouri Bourbon Law, legislation that sets out the standards for what can legally be called a Missouri bourbon. The other night in Washington, I found out the backstory behind that new law. It's the brainchild of Don Gosen who owns the Copper Mule Distillery in Herman, Missouri. A couple of years ago, I had been in the brewing business for about 25 years, and I was kind of switching over to the distilled spirits industry. And as I started to look more and more into what distilled spirits had to offer, what Missouri had to offer, I 
you know, bourbon's always been my favorite, and I started formulating this idea, you know, you got Kentucky bourbon, you got Tennessee whiskey, why not Missouri bourbon? We got we make the best barrels in the world. We got some of the greatest corn in the world, and and we've got everything we need. You know, we got the raw materials. We can do it all right here. And so I put together uh, the Missouri Bourbon Bill, wrote the language for it, uh, got passed it along to a friend of mine who was in the Missouri uh, House at that time. He filed the bill, and everybody hated it. And part of the thing was. No one really understood what the purpose of it was. They they felt it was going to be restrictive and maybe keep them from uh, partic- you know making certain products, and so it, it went nowhere the first year. So the next year, I became uh, very involved with the Craft Distillers Guild, who helped me champion this bill, and they kind of took it on. The guild took it on as their project, seeing some of the potential of this. We solicited help from the Missouri Corn Growers Association, the Missouri Wood Products Association, Forest Products Association, uh, and and got a coalition supporting the bill. The the two biggest industries in Missouri are agriculture and tourism, and this was kind of combined in those industries, bringing together the agriculture industry and the tourism industry into one product. And, you know, like like you were saying, it's something that can protect the the brand that Missouri brand we're not trying to be something we're not we're not trying to outdo someone else we're just trying to say hey Missouri is is here to make some really good bourbon and we want people to know it for what it is a Missouri bourbon made with Missouri raw materials in Missouri uh, for everybody to enjoy what kind of reaction have you gotten since uh, word of this got through and since the governor signed it well since he signed it it's been great I, I've had even some of the wineries in the state have stopped by the owners and said, "Hey, you know, we want to. You know, we did a, a Missouri wine, but uh, they wanted to know more about Missouri bourbon. I think they saw it as, hey, we, there's a new kid on the block that we better start watching out for.' But uh, it, it's been very positive. Uh, our members of the guild have had people coming into their distilleries and, can I get Missouri bourbon yet? When will it be available? And of course, people that have been making it under those uh, rules." Can start calling it Missouri bourbon right away. Uh, some people will have to make adjustments in the recipes or processes, but uh, it's been very positive uh, reaction from all over the country, actually. Gosen's own Missouri bourbon is still a long ways away. His spirit is still maturing at the distillery in Missouri made barrels, of course. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Keeping American whiskey history and tradition alive isn't just a marketing slogan. It's part of Heaven Hill's fabric. When other distillers were getting out of the rye whiskey business, Heaven Hill saved the legendary Rittenhouse rye from becoming a footnote in the history books. Today, it's the rye whiskey of choice. In a cocktail, or neat, with a distinct spicy flavor all its own. Find out more at heavenhilldistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Before we move on, I have a special announcement that's especially for our listeners in Australia. I'm heading your way soon. I don't usually announce my travel plans ahead of time unless I'm going to be at a whiskey festival or another public event. But I've been invited to visit Australia later this month as part of a Starward Distillery press trip. And they've agreed to carve out some time on the agenda so that we can have a meetup or two with listeners while I'm there. Now, the agenda is still in flux, but I know that I'll be at the Tasmanian Whiskey Week Spirits Showcase event in Hobart on Saturday, August 17th. And I'm hoping to have some time in Melbourne and Sydney during that following week before I head home. Keep an eye on our social media feeds for details. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events. Lots going on around the world this month. Whiskey Fringe is this coming weekend in Edinburgh, Scotland, along with the Railbird Festival at Keeneland in Lexington, Kentucky. Tasmanian Whiskey Week gets underway this coming weekend in Australia and runs through the 18th. McTeers and Bonhams both have whiskey auctions on August 16th. The McTeers auction is in Glasgow. The Bonhams auction will be in Hong Kong. 
The Whiskey Social Falkirk is on the 17th in Stenhouse Muir, England. And Sagamore Spirit Distillery has a Whiskey on the Waterfront party that same day in Baltimore, Maryland. Westport Whiskey and Wine in Louisville, Kentucky hosts Jim Rotledge for a Cream of Kentucky Bourbon tasting on the 22nd. That's just ahead of the Bourbon Women's Annual Symposium Conference, the 23rd through the 25th at the Seelbach Hilton in Louisville. Whiskey and Barrel Night at the Highland Games rounds out the month August 31st and September 1st in Pleasanton, California. Right now, we have 214 different events on the searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a whiskey festival, a tasting, or any other whiskey-related event coming up, just use the contact form at our website to let us know about it, and we'll be glad to add it to the list. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast In Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. Pretend for a minute that you're in Hollywood, and this story is being pitched as a movie script. It's Tennessee in the Civil War era, and a young white man befriends a black slave who teaches him how to distill whiskey. The two become friends, and when the war ends and brings with it the end of slavery, the white man decides to open his own distillery, hires his mentor, and they start making what eventually becomes one of the world's best-selling whiskeys. Okay, let's be honest. The writer pitching that script would have probably bounced a couple of times after being thrown out of the studio. The thing is, though... The story of Nathan Nearest Green and Jack Daniel is a true story. We've talked with Uncle Nearest Whiskey founder Fawn Weaver about this story before, but the first phase of her Uncle Nearest distillery opens next month in Lynchburg, Tennessee, just to tell this story. And the latest edition of her Uncle Nearest Whiskey has just been released. I caught up with Fawn the other day while she was in London, on a phone connection that wasn't as rock-solid as I would have liked. Tell me about this seven-year-old version of Uncle Nearest. Uh, it is, it's essentially the same as our 1856, except, of course, 1856 is a blend of eight, nine, ten, and eleven-year-old. Generally speaking, we have the 1820, our single barrel, and so for all of the eleven-year-old, we take samples of it, and if it proofs over 108, which for us is an anomaly because we intentionally try to proof down. And so if it proofs over 108, then it becomes a candidate for 1820. And then everything that proofs below 108 that's in that 11-year, um, in that age range, will still get blended into 1856. Well, 1884, our newest release, Uncle Nearest 1884, is a solid seven years old. We aren't blending any other years in it. For the most part, uh, because I am choosing the barrels, I'm intentionally choosing barrels that were the barrel entry date is on the same day or near the same day, and that they were stored in a similar place in the warehouse. So you're getting the most consistency because we're not taking something that is being stored higher on a higher floor and then something that's being stored lower. It's all pretty much in that same area. And it, it was a little bit of a of a test and a gamble, and we we pulled out uh, on this one, I believe we pulled 30 totes, which was I selected between five and seven barrels for each of the totes, and each of those blends are what we then tasted. And uh, for this particular one, Nearest Green's descendants are the ones who choose which ones actually make it into the blend. And so for this one, Victoria Edie Butler was the is Nearest's great granddaughter. She's the first person 
to curate her own batch. And so she sat in the tasting room along with a tasting panel and tasted all 30 totes. Now, we all gave our opinion. I was, of course, one of the people on the tasting panel, but none of us actually chose what would make it in. And there were some where we did not like it for one reason or another. And Victoria would say, well, I like it and this is the reason why. And it would go in. So what is here, I'm incredibly proud of, but the family, Nearest's family, is so incredibly proud of because it was truly their batch. And uh, so I told Victoria that whiskey is clearly in her blood because the reviews on this for every person who has tasted it uh, from the press, and you would have tasted it if you were in New Orleans. Yeah, I know. (laughs) But everyone else that was in New Orleans on the press side of it that tasted it, hands down, everyone just had really remarkable things about to say about both the nose, the palate, the mouthfeel, everything about it, I would say is spot on. Now explain the significance of the dates and the years in these. Yeah, so every single label has a, a year that is associated with it. The 1820 is the year that we believe that Nearest was born. Now we have to remember that he was born into slavery more likely than not. We have no birth certificate for him, and so we don't really know. In 1880, the census taker essentially would have looked at him and guessed his age, because Nearest would not have known. At that time, we weren't exactly counting the days of living, right? So, so we weren't counting how many, how many years we were. So that census taker in 1880 looked at him and said, he's 60 years old, and that's what he wrote down. And so that is the 1820. 1856 is the year that we believe that Nearest helped to perfect the Lincoln County process. And the reason why I say that is the Lincoln County process, that mellowing or filtering of whiskey through sugar maple charcoal, which is a requirement of Tennessee whiskey, did not begin in Tennessee, and it didn't begin in Lincoln County. You see it in Kentucky first, and then you see it in Robertson County and some other areas in Tennessee before it ever makes it to Lincoln County. But when you see it in other places, what they were utilizing is completely different than what Nearest ended up using, what he ended up teaching Jack Daniel, and what they continue to use to this day. And so that process, the reason why we say 1856 is when you look at the biography of Jack Daniel, what the biographer has as his age in going to live at that farm where Nearest was the master distiller, and uh, what Dan Cole, the person who was renting Nearest, I guess you would say, he didn't own him, but Nearest was on his property, was his master distiller, and he was a slave. So however that worked, when Jack arrived there somewhere around 1856, Nearest was already the master distiller, so he had already perfected the craft by that time. And so that is the reason why we use 1856. And then 1884 is the last year that we believe that Nearest put his own whiskey into barrels. And the reason is, is that's the year we believe that he retired. His boys, who continued on in the family tradition of making whiskey, went with uh, Mr. Jack Daniel to his lo- his new location, which is where he now currently, uh, th- the namesake of him, resides. And that happened in 1885. So that is why we have 1884 as the last year that we believe that Nearest put his own whiskey into barrels. And that's when he was working for Jack Daniel or with Jack Daniel. He was. He was work. Yeah, he was. He was working for him. Mind you, he was his, he was his master distiller, so he was working for him. But essentially, he was working with Jack Daniel as they were more colleagues. The way uh, instead of uh, really a boss employee relationship of the time, really, well, right? Absolutely. I mean, all of my employees are colleagues of mine. <laughs> but. But they still, but they still work for me, even if I don't treat them as such. And so right. I think it was a very similar type of relationship. Yes. Let's talk about the new distillery because I hear you're getting ready to open this thing in September. Finally, we are. We are actually. I just saw that the the Tennessean had the exclusive on the story, and I just saw that they that they posted it for their subscribers. So I assume it will release within the next day or so in the the paper itself. 
but we purchased a 270-acre Tennessee walking horse farm at the end of 2017. And we purchased it because Tennessee is essentially known for three things. Our music, so country music, bluegrass, anything that you would find, Memphis type of music, all of that, Tennessee walking horses and Tennessee whiskey. And so we wanted to bring those three things together. Uh, But through the process, ironically, as we began looking into the different inventions of Tennessee, we came across some really interesting things to incorporate as a part of learning the Tennessee heritage. So our heritage hall, which actually will not open until phase two, which is next summer, what opens this summer is our phase one. So that's our tasting room, that's the visitor center, the VIP center, Toppy's Bar, um, which is essentially a, a, a small cocktail bar, and uh, our bottling house and horse stables and that kind of stuff. So one about one fourth of the property opens up on September 5th of this year. But the Heritage Hall, which will open up on our phase two, that will include all things Tennessee history, meaning anything that our state is incredibly proud of that we invented, those things that we can kind of put our flag on it and say, this is 100% Tennessee. We have a Heritage Hall that's about 7,000 square feet that uh, we've been working with historians and RJ agency to really create an experience that folks will not forget. But one of the things that we discovered in uncovering what was invented in Tennessee was miniature golf was invented in Tennessee. So we decided to make that a part of the distillery plant. <laughs> And so that is, it's not a distillery like you would be accustomed to seeing where you go in. And really the only thing that is there is an ability to taste whiskey and maybe walk around and see some barrels and some bottling. What you're going to see at the nearest green distillery is all those things, of course, but also an ability to play miniature golf, an ability to actually go to our bar or Barrel House Barbecue, which is the most popular barbecue place in Lynchburg and the surrounding areas, and quite frankly, in most of Tennessee, is building out their second location there. And so there's just going to be a lot of things there, the ability to ride Tennessee walking horses and to touch some of the championship Tennessee walking horses that have since retired but are are housed there at the nearest green distillery at Sand Creek Farm. So it's an interesting, interesting way to approach Uh, distillery experiences. What I wanted was something that my mother and father, who were both teetotalers, something that they could enjoy and something that someone like me who loves to drink whiskey (laughs) could also enjoy, but then also something that entire families could come to and everyone have something to do. So where's the distillery part of all this? Are you going to make whiskey out there too, or are you going to keep... uh using the folks that have been making it for you? Oh, no, no. The distillery portion of it will open with the phase two. Okay. And uh, no, we'll have quite a bit because our, our column still is 24 inches. So it, we'll be pumping a lot of whiskey out of there. Our rick houses are, I believe we have five in the initial plan, but each one holds about 20,000 barrels. So no, no, whiskey production will be front and center, but that's something that you can find at every distillery across the board. And quite frankly, we all do it very similarly from one to the next. If you're making a great premium whiskey, the steps that you are following are are quite similar. And so we wanted to create an experience that took people beyond what they could find at other distilleries. So let me ask you a more sensitive question here. You're talking about in your heritage hall, exhibiting all the things that Tennessee is proud of. How do you address the issue of slavery? Well, head on. So, yes, we're, we're talking about all the things that we're proud of. The thing that we have to consider is with this particular story, with Nearest Green, what he and his family overcame is remarkable. And so that will absolutely be on display. Now, what they had to go through in order to get there, that's really tough, but Here's the thing, and and I I share this with folks of every race all of the time. What I want to make sure that we are 
careful about doing, which I see happening a lot, and it, it bothers me a little bit, where you, you see younger white people that are taking on the burden and sin of their ancestors. And so they go into a, into a place where we're looking at things that are involving slavery and the original sin of this country, and, and they're completely weighed down. What I want to make sure happens when folks come to Nearest Green Distillery is that they see the other side of that, which was even in the midst of this horrific time in America, there were still whites and blacks who worked side by side, who respected one another, who treated each other well, and who after the Civil War continued to work with one another, and African Americans who were able to create wealthy lives for themselves immediately following the Civil War. So my vision for this is when people come in, they respect the past. We learn from the past. We understand not to make that type of mistake again. But we also appreciate that there were good Americans on both sides of this fight. And I want to make sure that that is what comes across when people are going through Nearest Green Distillery. How do you look at the situation we're in today with the for lack of a better term, almost backsliding in cultural, political, racial relations that we've seen over the last uh, several years from where we were, what we had accomplished in this society since the mid-60s. Yeah, I can't reconcile it. And, and I will tell you that it is the first time in, I am uh, 42, will be 43 this year, and what has happened from 2016 until now is the first time that I in my life have had to see things through a lens of race. And I never had. My father truly, my father and mother both, but truly raised us to see the world through the lens of grace. And so now having to look at things through this lens is unfortunate. I think it's unfortunate for the current generation that this is being thrust upon them. And I don't think it is general society that is doing this, but everyone is reacting to what is going on, which is essentially a political mudslinging that's going on. And then everyone is sort of taken position and decide which camp they want to be on. And really, when I look at this story, of Nearest Green and specifically the relationship that he and Jack shared and Jack's descendants and Nearest's descendants, this is the place where I gain most of my hope from that we can also overcome what we're dealing with right now. Because if they could do it, I, I assure you we were more racially divided then than we are now is as terrible as the situation is and, and the backsliding, the reality is is that I am an African-American woman who is not only the co-founder but the CEO of one of the fastest-growing independent American spirit brands in history. That could not have happened in the 1800s when we're talking about their story. And so the fact that we now have the ability to grow – uh, Samara Beers, the, the head of the Black Bourbon Society, and however many people they have, 10,000 members or something, you, you are all engaging in conversation on a daily basis about whiskey, about bourbon. That is something that would not have happened back then. We would have been in complete survival mode. And so I think that we are incredibly blessed as African Americans right now in this country to, for the most part, not have to be in survival mode and to really, if we put our minds to anything, can accomplish it. But at the same time, I think that it is sad that this lesson of Nearest Green and Jack Daniel is still applicable today. That is unfortunate. Well, I wouldn't sell yourself short on that, Fawn. You could have been the Madam C.J. Walker of the spirits industry. Yes, Madam C.J. Walker wasn't in the 1800s. <laughs> so, so I am literally talking about that time period when Nearest and Jack were working together. Jack died in 1911. Uh, by all accounts, Nearest died before 1900. And so that period of time when they were working together, you do not have these kind of success stories. You absolutely do not. But then again, you weren't around back then. You could have pulled this off. Somebody, <laughs> somebody could have done it. <laughs> and, 
as my husband would say, if I were alive back then, I would have been lynched because I'm too mouthy. <laughs> nobody would have, nobody would have put up with me, and I wouldn't have put up with anybody else. So, th- this is a this is a time when I am able to walk into a boardroom and speak my mind to a table of you know fifteen white males and not blink, not think twice about it. That is not something that we had the ability to do back then. And so we have to recognize how far we've come. But at the same time, to your point, I think it's it's really unfortunate that the reason why the story of Nears Green and Jack Daniel, the reason why it's resonating with people so much is because it's a story of hope for our current time. And I think you uncovered the story at just the perfect time when it needed to be uncovered. I agree. I think that well, we were in the in the in the heat of it actually. So if you think about it, 2016, when I read the article that Clay Risen wrote with the New York Times, we were in the thick of it of of the, the racial back and forth that has sort of been the catalyst for what we are seeing right now. And so I think the story came out when it came out because it needed to. And that story of hope that I see in this, I actually needed that because it was the first time that I was really looking at this country through a different lens. And what I saw, I didn't like. And it, and it quite frankly, was a bit scary. But now I just, every single time I see the fighting and the bickering and, and all of the, the racial comments on online or anywhere else, I'm always able to circle back to this story and this mission of what we're doing in the name of Nearest Green. I'm able to come back to this to be my my watering well, if you will. This is where I come to be refreshed. And I go back out into the world and, and trust that will all work itself out over time. Thanks to Fawn Weaver of Uncle Nearest Whiskey for joining us on Whiskey Cast in Depth. It's brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best-kept secret, hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous scotch whiskeys. Comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. I received a sample of the new Uncle Nearest 1884 Tennessee whiskey this week, so let's start off the What I'm Tasting This Week department with it. As we heard earlier, it's seven years old and bottled at 46.5% ABV. The nose is warm and sweet with notes of honey, molasses, pipe tobacco, maple syrup, and vanilla. The taste starts off sweet and smooth with honey and maple syrup notes, followed by a mild burst of black pepper and allspice, while pipe tobacco and charred oak notes linger in the background. The finish is long, smooth, and gentle with just a hint of spice. It's a solid sipping whiskey, and I'm scoring the Uncle Nearest 1884 Tennessee Whiskey a 92. Now, you can't tell the nearest green story without talking about Jack Daniel. So, let's look at the new Tennessee Tasters selection release from Jack Daniels. The barrel-proof rye is bottled at 63.8% ABV, The nose has soft baking spices, honey, a hint of maple, toasted oak, and a touch of rye bread baking in the oven. The taste is thick, chewy, and peppery with clove, cinnamon, and allspice notes, balanced by honey, a hint of molasses, brown sugar, and hints of dried fruits that come out as the spices fade. Water boosts the sweetness in the background, while not taking anything away from the spices. And the finish is dry and slightly oaky with just a touch of spice. I'm scoring the Jack Daniels Tennessee Tasters Selection Barrel Proof Rye a 93. The other night I had the chance to taste the new Kentucky Peerless Bourbon at its New York City debut. This one was released in Louisville at the end of June. It's a four-year-old bourbon bottled at 54.55% ABV or 109.1 proof. The nose has soft spices and touches of honey, vanilla, caramel, pipe tobacco, and subtle hints of dried fruits. The taste is peppery and intense, with a nice balance of dried fruits, honey, caramel, and just a touch of cocoa underneath. The spices fade slowly on the finish with hints of dried fruits and charred oak. 
this one was worth waiting four years for. I'm scoring the Kentucky Peerless Bourbon, a 93. Stay with us for more on this whiskey and its distiller in just a few minutes. I received a sample of the new Glenlivet 14-year-old single malt. It's finished in cognac casks and is exclusively available in the U.S. for now. It's bottled at 40% ABV. The nose has notes of raisins, toffee, red grapes, a subtle maltiness, and just a hint of spice. The taste is smooth with a good balance of tree fruits, dried flowers, raisins, and a hint of allspice. And the finish is long with a gentle touch of spices, tree fruits, and raisins. This one gets points for consistency, along with a smooth and gentle flavor. I'm scoring the Glenlivet 14-year-old a 92. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,600 different whiskeys from all over the world. You'll find it at whiskeycast.com. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreast Lestow Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Lestow. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Lestow Edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that will be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Pour yourself a bourbon and settle into a good story. Heaven Hill's backroom stories, told by those who've rarely shared before just how they shape the spirit and how the spirit shapes them. All the barrels are aging here. A lot of the airflow through the warehouse like this, you know, when you open a door, all that goodness hits you in the face. And, you know, it's something you never forget. Download and listen to the new podcast, Tales from the Hill, from Heaven Hill Distillery. Season 1 is available now on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, brought to you by Lot 40. If you're a bourbon collector on Facebook, you've probably heard by now that Facebook is cracking down on the use of its platform for whiskey selling and trading and has closed down many of the whiskey groups where illegal sales had been taking place for years. Keep in mind that, at least in the U.S., it is illegal in every state for individuals to sell alcohol without a liquor license, and that includes collectors trading rare bottles. There are a few exceptions, such as Kentucky's relatively new law that allows people to sell vintage bottles from their collections to a licensed bar or retailer. And some states do allow individuals to sell old bottles through a licensed auction house. While we have not had many cases of people trying to trade or sell whiskeys through the WhiskeyCast Facebook page, I posted a note on our page this week just to remind everyone that the page is not to be used for selling or trading whiskeys. We just want to make sure we're playing by Facebook's rules and, of course, the law. As you might expect, though... We did get some feedback on this. David McEldowney had this comment. It would be nice to see some good online auction sites in the U.S., like Scotch Whiskey Auctions in Glasgow. The auction sites in the U.S. charge way too much comparatively. I've not sold through Facebook, but I can see why the lack of good options in the U.S. send people in that direction. And Kevin Hogan posted this comment from Europe. Wow. So what do collectors do? This is just one more reason making me happy that I left for Europe 27 years ago. It has become a long list. Well, this is another one of those cases where the market is evolving faster than the laws that regulate it. It has not been legal for individuals to sell liquor without a license since at least the end of Prohibition. But remember, those laws were written to keep people from opening up after-hours bars and things like that. Keep in mind that the collector's market for whiskeys is a relatively new phenomenon, and laws are changing slowly to accommodate it. The biggest example is that law passed a couple of years ago in Kentucky that allows individuals to sell old, unopened bottles to licensed bars or retailers. 
States like New York have allowed wine auctions in the past, and they're now allowing auction houses to handle spirits as well. But with each state allowed to set its own policies on alcohol sales, I don't think you're going to see a large-scale online auction site open up in the U.S. anytime soon. It's not just whiskeys, though. Adam Keel has worked in several breweries, and he shared his thoughts with us. Here's what he had to say. It's rampant and out in the open, really bad in the beer world. The secondary market is getting out of control in craft beer. And as professional brewers, we aren't big fans of seeing our beer that might be sold for $15 for a bottle and it bringing in $100 or more through this relatively new black market. It's a huge complaint many beer lovers and breweries have with some of the breweries that are highly coveted that are raising prices higher and higher to take more of a cut out of that market. It's starting to price out many beer lovers, though. Same what happened to wine and spirits years before. That's one of the things I hate about my love for whiskey now is that I'm priced out of most of the stuff I want to try now. Especially U.S.-made whiskeys that once would cost $30 are now 70 or more. As soon as a strong recession or depression happens again, it's going to kill the industry, except for those that didn't jump on the pricing train or those that don't hold out with that pricing model. Adam, thank you for sharing that. And if you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. Our email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the science, history, and other stuff that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. I shared my tasting notes for the new Kentucky Peerless Bourbon just a few minutes ago, and I had the chance to talk with the distiller who made it the other night. It's actually the first bourbon Caleb Kilburn has brought to the market. He was coming out of college several years ago, when the Taylor family decided to get back into distilling almost a century after the original Peerless Distillery closed in 1917 at the start of World War I. One question I'm often asked is how someone can become a whiskey distiller, and Caleb Kilburn shared his story with us. Corky Taylor, along with his son Carson Taylor, uh, opened the distillery 98 years after the original distillery shut down. We released the Kentucky Straight Rye 100 years after, and then in 2019 we released the first bourbon in 102 years for Kentucky Peerless. What does that mean to you to have uh, your stamp on this? I mean, it's it's amazing. Uh, I, I, I can't believe that Carson and Corky had the faith in me and my abilities to... Uh, um, be able to bring this bourbon to fruition. I mean, uh, starting from scratch, uh, we didn't source any of our product. Everything that ever went into Kentucky Peerless as a bottle, everything that uh, we've been, ever produced or ever will produce is made in-house. And that's something that's really special to me, to our entire team. And if you're asking about me personally, yo, of course I love uh, the fact that I've been able to influence this product in my own way. How so? What did you do to influence it? Well, uh, when you talk about the setup Kentucky Peerless, uh, I was able to set up the equipment, the process, the pipe and mechanical systems, the uh, control logic, how everything from grain up until the point where we're bottling, everything as far as a process from equipment, from really anything in between I've been able to set up. Uh, when you talk about the mash bills, when you talk about the way we distill it, the way we mature it, at which point it's mature, and the fact that we go in uh, to the process using sweet mash, the fact that what comes out on the far end is left at barrel strength, non-chill filtered, all those are factors that I was able to help shape. And what's your background? Where did you? Uh, where were you before you wound up with these boys? So I, uh, I grew up on a dairy farm in eastern Kentucky. It's where I learned all my sanitary process, mechanical systems, piping, all that growing up. I went to college at Morehead State University. I started going out, shadowing different cookers, distillers, anybody who would take time to let me shadow them. Uh, at that point, I was able to work my way under a few people's wings. Uh, these people became my mentors. And actually, before I even graduated from college, they uh, put it was kind of an arranged marriage. 
they uh, they knew that Carson Corky needed someone at kind of the helm of production who was capable of bringing a grain all the way up to bourbon and rye. Uh, they knew that I had a lot of potential, but no particular direction to go. It was just a marriage made in heaven. So uh, my mentors introduced me to Carson Corky actually before I even graduated. I came on board, I started helping finish the demolition of the building, uh, helped with construction, installation of all the equipment. Uh, and like I said, it was a stepwise process starting with uh, construction and uh, this process engagement. The controls, the logic, everything, every piece along the way I was able to install or work or play a role in. And what did you get your degree in? I am a chemist. I have a chemistry degree with an integrated sciences minor, which is basically a fancy way of saying early on in my college uh, career, I didn't know whether I wanted to do physics leading to engineering, biology leading to some sort of my research, or chemistry leading to God knows what. But I uh, actually was pursuing all three as if I could major in any one of them. And that's why when Effie actually looked through and looked at my transcript, instead of having fun electives, my electives were in things like DC circuitry and uh, statistics and things like that. Uh, but in hindsight, those actually really helped me uh, as far as preparation to become a distiller. Uh, when I talk about that DC circuitry, for instance, I needed a lot of that information to be able to aptly wire the control units and actually uh, go in and understand how uh, uh, delta values worked and things of that nature. So you're not overeducated at all, right? No, no. No, absolutely. The, uh, the bulk of the relevant knowledge that I use on a daily basis comes from my upbringing on the dairy farm and from learning from people within the industry. So I don't, I don't believe there's anything overeducated about that. Now, who were your mentors? Let's give them some credit here. Okay, so first is going to be, we'll go with Pete Kamer, who's a retired distiller engineer out of Barton Brands, Rob Sherman, who's the president of Vendum Copper and Brass Works, uh, Randy Alexander, who is the... Uh, He's a former head of maintenance for Jim Beam, who is now operating as a consultant also. So Pete and Randy are consultants helping build and train new distillers and uh, design new processes. And Rob is the one who makes the equipment. The Bendham Copper and Brass Works, they are the, uh, the, it's just amazing. They're the equivalent of Apple for the steel world, but even a little more dominant. And there's really a lot of opportunities out here for a young person who wants to get into this industry, isn't there? Well, they, uh, the craft distilling industry is really kind of following the way that craft breweries went. Uh, started off, uh, if you look back 20, 30 years ago, you have a few powerhouses who've been around forever who um, produce a very streamlined product. Uh, but now, as people are having a taste for the unique, the local, the fun, the different, uh, there's so much room for craft distilleries to pop up and really make an impression. And this creates a massive demand. Uh, demand for young people who understand the process, who want to get into it. And I say young people, it's uh, anybody who's willing to learn and educate themselves and go in. It's not an ageist thing. Uh, a lot of distilleries are being started with people who've either had a long-standing engagement in history in the industry, uh, people who've worked at the big brands who are looking to get out on their own, uh, all the way down to youngsters who are uh, eager to learn and get out there and uh, share what they know. Did you have any family history in whiskey before this? They didn't even drink within my household. Uh, there was, uh, if you look up a few generations, there's some people who really liked whiskey, but other than that, there was hardly nothing. Uh, pretty much everything that uh, I've been able to do, I, I, I've been blessed to find people who are willing to help me, but I didn't have anything uh, as far as the lineage. Thanks to Caleb Kilburn of Kentucky Peerless Distilling for sharing his story. And if you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this episode of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast. You'll also find the latest whiskey news, tasting notes, the whiskey photo of the week, 
and a complete archive of past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. Now, I want to tell you how to make sure that you never miss a single episode of Whiskey Cast. All you have to do is click on the subscribe button in your favorite podcast app, whether you use Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or another app. That way, you'll get every episode as soon as it drops. You can also get Whiskey Cast on Spotify, the iHeartRadio app, and your home smart speaker, too. We love hearing from you. Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no Redbreast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2019, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.